Hi everyone. Welcome to the lost generation outside of the mainstream. My name is William Hooker. I am a musician, poet, and part of this generation of artists. My goal with this podcast, which is being broadcast on its own YouTube channel and my website, williamhooker.com, is to introduce you to many of the musical artists that are outside of the mainstream and have made important artistic contributions to our culture. I have also interviewed producers of the music and many fans and supporters of this work. My guests are sharing what makes this art form unique and significant. I hope these conversations will inspire you to listen to the music, which may change you and the way you view music, which again is outside of the mainstream. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing Lisa Sokolov, singer, composer, and educator. I hope to be airing new interviews on the first of each month. We are presenting these interviews and we have so many amazing interviews coming up that you will be hearing in the future. This is The Lost Generation Outside of the Mainstream. This is a story that needs to be told. I am in the presence of a good friend, an extremely great musician. Thank you. Ms. Lisa Sokolov. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be and, here. And Lisa, um, I would like you briefly, um, can I just say you're a vocalist and an instrumentalist, or are you primarily a vocalist? I would say I'm primarily a vocalist who also plays piano. Okay. Would you just briefly uh, tell us who you are, what you do? All right. Yes. So I am a singing being, um, interested in the non-verbal language of singing. Um, I, I'm interested in singing as a language, and I'm interested in what it is as a singer that the instrument, I am the instrument, and I am the player, and I'm and that singing brings you into a profound connection with both the physical and the non-physical. And I'm very interested in that. Wow. And I'm also, um, so I'm a singer, composer, I'm also a professor for many, many decades at, um, at NYU's Experimental Theater Wing. Great. And yeah. you're, you're teaching what? A nonverbal singing is language, improvised singing. Oh, uh-huh. And how long have you been doing that? 30-something years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Was that a known um, branch of education when you first entered it? I don't think so. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, I would say that, um, you know, I've always been very interested in the wider um, applications and powers of music. Okay. And I've also always been an introverted person. And so this idea of what it means to really go inside. And you know, Jung talks about introverts, that for an introvert, the world, the inner world of archetype and of the abstraction is real. And it's as real for them as the outer world is real for extroverts. And so I've always been really interested in coming to meet these phenomena of interval. You know, what is interval? What is... Um, what is the experience of a perfect fourth, you know, and how do you come to understand it? Um, as well as what is the archetype of the body, what is it to sing? And um, I, as a young person, I had crazy neurological headaches and was on very powerful painkillers as a young kid. And at a certain point I thought, well, this is, you know, morphine, Demerol, you know, not good to like keep dealing with that. So then I said to myself, you know, how are you going to navigate it without that? So I went into a room when I would get ill and just go inside and figure out. Um, the first step was to differentiate 
what I would call primary pain and secondary pain. Mm. Primary pain being the pain of the moment, secondary pain, the pain that goes on top of it because of stress and fear of pain. And I started to separate that out and then I started to really identify what was actually happening rather than what was I afraid was happening. And then I realized that through breath work I could shift my nervous system and through tone I could mm -hmm. get in touch with emotional stuff and I was able to make these episodes very short, which used to be very long and scary. What, so, what a, at what age were you? I would say around 14, 15. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So that was really a starting point right, right. in many ways. And also that the piano was always a sanctuary for me, you know, that it was a vehicle in which I could go into communication with something deep inside myself, but also something bigger than myself. So that was always something that really interested me. Huh. Wow, Lisa. Yeah, so that's been my road. And, yeah. And um, so I was a musician my whole child life, choral singer, played flute, violin, played a lot of instruments, pianist, came from a classical thing. And um, in the public school I went to, there was a conducting class. Uh -huh. My dad played stride piano. He was an Art Tatum fanatic. Okay. And I would, you know, <laughs> we would we would have ongoing conversations around that. And um, I, after class one day, the teacher said, "Don't go." And he played me Coltrane, and that just, you know, totally blew Where my mind. From? Where are you from? My family is originally from Brooklyn. Oh, okay. And then, um, and then moved to Long Island. Yes. And then back in. The city. Wow. Yeah. So this is this is your your evolution. What? Right. What has occurred? Right. All right. Now, um, generally, you've seen the method to our madness here. Yes. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, yes. and uh, you could take them any way you want, Great. and then we'll deal with uh, certain people that I feel are outside the mainstream. Mm-hmm. And you tell me about how you feel about their music. Great. So, first thing I wanted to ask you is. Has the position of women in the avant-garde music gotten better since you began singing or gotten worse? I think definitely it's gotten better. I think it's gotten better. I would say there's younger players coming up. I, I would say there's more room for um, women players. I, and I, I don't think it's in any way solved in any way. Right. Um, but I think that there are, there are some, what's that lady trumpet player who's been playing a lot in the William world who's so amazing? I don't know. Ahmed Abdullah? No. Amy Jensen? No. Bill Dixon? No. <laughs> we can talk about Bill. Yeah, so after, you know, <laughs> after I heard about Coltrane, then it was time to go to college. And so then I decided I heard that Jimmy Garrison was teaching up in Vermont so I went there and uh, and that's where I studied with Bill and with Milford and with Metamorphosis. Jimmy Lyons and all those folks well I don't know I, I, I'm just yeah. I'm just acting cantankerous but well, <laughs> I'll remember it'll that. come to me you know it's like the the helpers in the brain take longer because there's so right. much information right but it'll come to me so all I right. think that there are more women players Arthur are, Brooks Arthur Brooks was up there, certainly. Yes. Would you tell me something about his music? Before we talk about Jamie Branch. Jamie Branch. <laughs> that will be it. No, but, but would you tell me something about Arthur Brooks? You know, I haven't seen Arthur for, you know, 30 well, something years. what was his years. music like? Because I ran into him in, in Princeton. That's wild. Now, yeah. You know, so he was, you know, we were in big bands together. You know, we were in Bill's big band together. We were in Jimmy Lyon's big band together. You know, so I know him as a band member. I, be, member. I don't know him so much as, as his own thing. Okay. But a beautiful player. Yeah. You, so you see where I'm going with this. I hope so. Because, because, <laughs> you see where I'm going with, because basically, I feel that he is one of the people that exhibits um, the perfection or, or the effort toward going to perfection of one's instrument in a time when it was very, very difficult to play this kind of music. Mm -hmm. 
and people were less open, I believe. No, maybe they weren't less open. Maybe the 60s people were more open. When you maybe really that's think about ESP actually right, exactly. And like, you know, right. actual BYG, all mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Jacques Courcel. Don't know. Oh, okay. Um, he's one of a, a person that was younger, but he was in with uh, the Alan Silva groups. Right, right. And, uh, and, and many people went to Europe, obviously. Right. But um, back to what you were saying, though, because right. you did mention Jamie, Jamie Branch, and I would like to say that that's a person we haven't spoken of. Can you tell me something about her music? I just, you really uh, she's just one fierce player, and she's just fierce, and she's got some serious sound, and the girl could blow free with such power and uh, liberation, and it's just thrilling. It's just thrilling you. to hear her. She's right got then. some real power, and that's beautiful. And she's, you know, a younger generation. There are some beautiful young players. All right, then. Okay. Um, well, uh, so you you definitely are... I, I, in, I get a feeling you're telling me things are better. I think so. Okay. All right, yeah. then. And that's a positive thing. Oh, absolutely. Now, on the negative side, what would you say is happening and has to be changed? Whew. You know, I mean, I I do remember, I mean, people have to be woken up to the fact that there are women playing and that, you know, the, and I don't know if this has to be, has to do with my personality type or, or my gender, okay. but, you know, there's a certain kind of rules of the game. As long as I've been in this scene, which has been a long time. <laughs> I still don't what are get the, rules the of fucking the rules. What of the are the game? rules? Let give me, give me like, give me three rules. Give me three. I rules. don't know the rules. That's well, what I'm saying. I Where I feel <laughs> like there are dudes that know the rules. They know the and rules. And they keep showing up, and they keep, you know. For me, it's like, I just don't know the rules. I don't know, like, I don't know how to like play that. There's a certain hierarchy thing. I just don't know how to do that. And so I have relied on, as they said in. <laughs> Teddy Sully and the kindness of strangers. No, but I have relied on people like William Parker, oh, you see. know, to keep me um, alive in the outer world. You know that. Um, how does one do that? How does, how does how, William do how that? Does another, no, how does another person keep your inner self alive in the outer Not world? Not my inner self, but my, you know, he, he, he calls up and says, let's make this record. Or he calls up and says, let's do this gig. Okay. You know, so he reaches out and says, come on. And so that's, that's very helpful for me because I don't know how to do that. I, I'm not been a person who's, you know, I see certain players who are just genius at knowing how to navigate the outer world in the business of music. I've never been able to do that. But that's me. But the thing about it is, Lisa, you see, the thing that I've, the, the thing that, um, impresses me about your self mm -hmm. is the fact that you and I met and we talked. Yes. And through that, that's one reason why you're why I wanted to have you here. Yeah. So regardless of yes, it, it was it was absolutely yeah, you, you in the right like that. in the right scenario with the right yeah. person. Boom, absolutely here. But just. Just in terms of knowing how to navigate the business of music, I've never, been, I've never known how to do that. My daughter is a brilliant singer, yeah. and um, both my kids wow. are just brilliant musicians. Uh -huh. My son sing, is more out there than me, and my daughter is more inside than me. Okay. And um, I watch her capacity to navigate the world of it. It's a beautiful thing. Some people have that gift, and some people don't necessarily have that gift. That's true. That's yeah. that's something that um, Hazrat Iniyat Khan, mm -hmm. the Sufi, of course. Message, he speaks of um, uh, the uh, the use of the personality, mm -hmm. and uh, he but 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 uh, that's one side of it. But he also mentions uh, the jewels from the ocean unseen, mm -hmm. and and I think that. Um, what I what what this what the purpose of this is, is to deal with the jewels from the ocean that have been unseen. Beautiful. Because, that's what it is, really. Right. I mean, that's that's why I was like playing that game about the people that you right. mentioned, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Another question that I have for you is, 
in which ways oh well, well let me see how do you feel how do you feel I know you as an excellent vocalist how do you feel when you see and you're a master of what you're doing There's, it's obvious to me What goes across your mind when you see people that aren't on that level and they achieve all of this fame and recognition and worldly wealth in, in many cases? Right. Uh, and I won't say it's more than a feeling mm -hmm. because a lot of times it, it actually deals with retaliatory action that one takes, which is not so evolved. But that's a whole other story. How do you feel about that? These people that get all of you, I mean, you know, they're all up in your grill. You can go, you know, you just get a magazine, just open it up, there they are. Correct. What What they do that's I was so just great. talking to my daughter about how this. How does this work? Right. Right. Well, how yeah. do you feel about that? You know, it's the nature of the world. It's the nature of this world. It's the nature of the, um, the, meditation on money and hierarchy and status and you know it's the nature of this world i did a gig in um mm -hmm. I, I did a gig in australia and cameron brown w came out with me it was the two of us mm -hmm. and it was a big festival you know and this young critic came up afterwards and started talking to me well the big news you know the the headline was that you know, that I was singing and I was 50 years old. You know, 50-year-old vocalist, you know, the big news, you know. And, and she said to me at one point, she said, she said, I'd like to ask you, how are you and Britney Spears related? And I was like, really, you're asking me that question? And I said, we're not related, you know, we're completely on other levels. They're, you know, we're not, we're completely other levels. And that there, is, there are people who use music to attain a certain fame, to get to a certain place on this patriarchal hierarchy. Okay. And there are people who are deep devotees of music. And uh, it's a very different thing. It's a different thing. All right. Um, I'm going to just look in my, my uh, cards over here. And I'm going to mention some people, which are not necessarily on your list. I know. Right. But I think that you will know of these people because you've been, I you've hope been on so. the scene for quite a I while. I hope so, but I probably don't. Masahiko Kono. Yes, beautiful, beautiful. I played with him years and years back, years and years back. Beautiful trombone player. Just beautiful, beautiful. What was it about Kono's playing that was a little bit different than Curtis Fuller's? For example. Right. If you can remember it, I mean, you know. Right, I'm going there. I just work. remember him, him as being extremely powerful and also an inward person who was able to really pull something forward through his horn. That was just incredibly beautiful and a beautiful soul. All right. So you see where I'm going with this? I, I don't know if I right. do. You no, but you see where yes. I'm going with yes, these I names. Yes, I think maybe. Right, right. Um, do you know Elliot Levin? I do know Elliot Levin. Philadelphia person? Yes, I do know Elliot Levin. But I can't, I do know him, but I can't speak to it too much. Malachi Thompson? Mm, don't know him. All right, he's a trumpet player. Um, this person has been mentioned before. I'm not going to go here with him. Um, do you know Mark Dresser? I do know Mark Dresser. Well, I'll talk about him. Let's please do. Oh, let's see? talk about him. You see what I'm talking about? All right, then. What would you like to say? About I'd like to say, I'm going to talk about Mark Tresser's music. Yes. I would like to say in one way, he is the most innovative, innovative dude I ever played with. That his level of creativity is so intense that you never know what's going to happen next. And that's just thrilling. I, I think that he's really something. That's my feeling. I think he, I, I, I think I played one or two gigs with him and it's like, you never know. You just never know. He's so not cliched. He's such a deep adventurer. 
And I'm a total fan. Wow, see? That's what I would say about Mark Dresser. Interesting, yeah. interesting. And he is of our generation. Yes, he is. You see, that's what I'm, that's what, right. that's what, that's the purpose of this. Yes, and his relationship to tone is just awe-inspiring. Wow. How he mics his bass with these microphones, you know, because that's the other piece. You know, as a singer, you know, the level, the overtone situation is so deep and wide and high and whew, and you're never going to get that on recording. You're only going to get that in the live situation, no mics, live situation, because all that electronic shit reduces your field. And Mark no, has this whole... explain that a little bit more. Explain uh -huh. that a little bit more about the reduce, reduction of the field. Explain right. That so, you know, if you have, if you look at the sonic pattern of instruments, instruments, you know, profiles, blah, 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 then you got the cello, wow. And then, and then you have the, so if the cello's resonant properties were the size of this apartment, the, then you move to the level of voice. Well, the voice is like blocks and blocks in terms of the levels of overtones. The, the vibrational field of a human voice is massive, unparalleled, really, by any other external instrument. Interesting. Go. Yeah. Oh, please. And so, you know, Mark, on his, on his bass, has set up these very specific microphones, ones that just pick up the high end that go here, ones that pick up the low so that he can get as much information in an electronic signal as possible. But any electronic signal, any recording, any microphone, all that, you know, it's not possible for the glory of the human voice to fit through it. It's got to be squeezed and certain shit's got to be erased. It's got to be compressed? Yeah, I mean, not literally, really? I but I mean, go. A, 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 a speaker is not going to do justice to what is the tone of the human voice. I see, I see, I get it, I get it. Right. And a recording is not going to do justice to what is the power of the human voice. You know, if you imagine, you listen to a recording of Mahalia, and then if you were in the room with her, right. you know, and my wacky vision is that these things are all keys that are unlocking these larger fields. And, you know, as a musician, whether it's improvising or whether someone is giving you a piece of music, right. you know, they're giving you a map and you're, you're taking the key. And when, and when you get the key in the door, fatunga tunga ha ha, there you are. Right. Um, the book that you're writing. Yes. Would you elaborate on that? Yes, I could talk about it a little bit. Oh, uh, yeah, briefly. Yes. Right. What, so, what's the title of it? So the, the title, the working title is Beyond Singing embodied voice work in the language of music. But Great. it has to be changed because of library things. So I don't know what it's going to be called yet. Okay. But that's the working title. Um, you know, so I started teaching many years ago, decades and decades ago. I would see people and teach and it became very clear very quickly that inhibitions in singing were not really technical. That most of them were energetical or emotional. Okay. Uh, and and as I start to work with people and you start to open their throats and their hearts and you start to connect them with impulse, wild transformation happens. Okay. And um, so I've been doing that work for, you know, 40 something years. I, as a young person, I worked mm -hmm. in psychiatric units and at places out in Far Rockaway, which were kind of the end of the line for people with chronic long-term really? mental illness, schizophrenia. And I did that for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And I heard some of the greatest music I ever heard in my life. How do you mean? I mean, just deepest, truest, you know, out there at these places in Far Rockaway. Some of the names of these places I should remember because it's so well, ironic. When you say the music, how, how do you mean the music? So you sit Coming there with... a person? Oh, yeah. So you sit in there and... That wasn't really necessarily here, was, was in tune with something else out there? Totally, totally. Okay, yeah. You know, yeah. and, you know, so to go, I would do these groups, you know, with people who were, you know, the end of the, the cult society is not interested at all. And they take them and they've been in hospitals for lifetimes and they put them in these, you know, high line manner. I probably shouldn't say it out loud. And, you know, so I would go in there and there'd be all these older guys and a lot of older guys from the South. And, you know, and I would, uh, you know, I would bring a guitar. I don't play guitar, but I play enough to, you know, and we just uh -huh. start to sing. And just bring them in, and then you start to play the blues, and you start to hear the blues of people who've been through the, who've been through it, and there's something so moving and profound and real, and you know, and 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 that kind of, that kind of longing to really hear what a human is and really understand what the role of music is, which is wow. a emotional spiritual practice, 
You know, that has nothing to do with who's in that magazine. It has nothing to do with it. There are no. people in that magazine who get that. But that was very profound. And so this book, and so I used yes. to, I used to, I worked a lot with people in extreme pain or people with AIDS or all music therapy stuff for many decades. Mm -hmm. um, I taught music therapy at NYU for 10 years before I got the full-time gig at the School of the Arts. Um, this book is the method that I have developed over these 40-something years of doing that. And wow. it just, it, it lays out a progression of coming to meet self, impulse, body, the nature of tone, the nature of interval, the nature of time, you know. It's so like it's a, more than just analyzation. You're oh, actually no, no, no. trying to oh, tell it's people a, it's how it's a phenomenological works. way how yeah. to come into relationship and for yourself to harvest the information that's in the body, you know, in a time where well, we're, we're so deeply alienated, where what the heck is true? You know, for me, when you go into the nature of the body, you go into the nature of tone and overtone, you go into the nature of, you know, th that starts to reveal information, how the heart works, expansion, contraction, rest. That's very profound when you get that, because you're in a, you're in a patriarchal commercial culture. Okay. And it doesn't give a shit about expansion, contraction, rest. You know, you're supposed to be ever ready, ever doable, ever this, you know. sell something. Right. Yeah, so, you know, I get it. I've gone into the wisdom of the body and the breath and the nature of resonance, what the difference between resonant theory and hierarchical theory. This book is based on and what I do with my students at NYU. They come in there, they are all set in this hierarchical world. They had to do, be a certain kind of kid to get, get in there. Sure. And then all of a sudden you go, well, let's look at the theory of resonance and the fact that every one of us has to come around. And, you know, what is the role of art versus commercialism? That's very powerful. How long do you think it is going to take before this is completed to your, to your satisfaction? The book? Yes. Oh, I've been working on it for decades, and, and I'm on the final edit with the editor. Well, I definitely would like to I, want to, I want to be one of the first people that's notified when this comes out. I thank you. Because, Lisa, when I first came to New York at 14 years old, I came here as a singer. Oh, really? Who knew? Of course you did. I did. I came here as a singer. And um, that was supposed to change my life. Right. And um, I'm very, very interested in the voice. I'm very, very interested in singing. I understand. I understand. I understand it coming from another, another direction. Right. But still, um, just I just wanted to share that with you because... I want you to know how important what you're getting ready to right. come out with is for me. Thank you. I want you to know that. I'm yeah. going to go into another person. All right. Let's see. Jay Rosen. Jay Rosen. Jay Rosen. Jay Rosen. Move on. Move on? Yes, because he's going Move like on. this. Move on. Okay. Yeah. Um, Richard Keene. Richard Keene. Beautiful. Beautiful player. Beautiful. Played with him with Cecil. Right? Cecil uh, Taylor. Right. Okay. Beautiful player, powerful, beautiful, soulful, beautiful man. And uh, what? All right, then we won't we won't speak about your role with Cecil Taylor, but um, were you were you dealing with words at that point in time, or were you dealing with tone mostly? With Cecil? Yes. Tone. Okay. Okay. Um, but I see t words as sonic phenomena. I do write poetry, and I do write lyric, but. But but interested in the nature of vowel and consonant as sonic, as a sonic experience. That's interesting. Now that is interesting. Now wait. that's why we love Shakespeare so much because he does that. Really? Yes. So it wasn't a mistake that Richard was Richard and Ophelia was Ophelia. But what's the difference between let's say a, a, a Chaucer and a, a, um, a Shakespeare? In um, terms of Old English, and is, it, is there any sort of relationship in terms of what, how, how the words are spoken in the tone of the words? You know, I've just started acting again. All right, That's another whole topic. All right, I'm, I'm saying, yeah. But I would say with Shakespeare, you know, the thing about Shakespeare, at least in my experience, is that it is profoundly musical. Okay. And, and that, that everything he writes is this, is understanding something essential about vowel and consonant 
that is something that I dig deeply, though. I'll just ask you one more person. Um, no, I won't ask you one more person. I'll ask you this question. Um, Lisa, do you think that we have changed the people of the 70s that I consider to be outside the mainstream have changed the nature of those people who were in Cecil's and Ornette Coleman and John Coltrane's generation? Ask me that question again. How have we changed, not, not how have we changed it, do you think the changes that we have made in that one decade mm -hmm. have worked to the positive fulfillment of the evolution of this music? Yes. And how? Yes. Because you were around with, the, with uh, Ascension and Ohm, and, and all of a sudden out of that came... Right. Yeah. How have we, how have we contributed to this? So, I mean, that's a, it's a complicated question. Maybe the contribution is that it's a more communal scene in a certain way. Beautiful! That's what I would say. That's what I would say. It's very different than, than the... Right. It's a more communal scene, and it's a more... Uh, it's a less hierarchical scene. Thank you. You're welcome. Lisa Sokolov. So much fun. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you for tuning in. In months ahead, you will have the opportunity to hear from many more Lost Generation artists and supporters. The audio-only version is available wherever you get your podcast. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to hear upcoming episodes.